Hi friends, I have done a lot of soldering irons, but the one that we will make today is different from others. First, now there are no soldering irons of this type, so impossible to buy such device as they simply aren't on sale. Secondly, it is completely autonomous and is powered by built-in batteries. Third, such a soldering iron heats up in literally a couple of seconds. And finally, fourth, it has a temperature adjustment function. I must say there will be two videos devoted to this topic. Today we will consider the circuit and principle of operation. In the second video we will completely assemble the device. In the description you will find references to components for assembling such a soldering iron and a complete archive with the circuit and printed circuit board. The soldering iron is assembled on an impulse basis and consists of four parts. The power supply unit on lithium-ion batteries, the control board with the power part realized on N-channel field transistors, the impulse transformer, and finally, the tip. The principle of operation is very simple. The battery supplies power to a voltage converter controlled by a push-pull controller SG3525. The secondary winding of the transformer is a thick copper bus that is shorted by a tip, which, in consequence of a short circuit, heats up. The converter is quite powerful. If you don't control the power, the tip will literally melt. That's why I inserted in circuit a variable resistor of 10 kiloohm, which will allow manually changing the duty cycle of the pulses and will allow regulating the power of the soldering iron as a whole. The principle of control can be easily seen using an oscilloscope. For the sake of this, I use an excellent portable oscilloscope DS202, which I personally recommend. You can buy this by the link in the description. The price is around $100. The PWM regulation is actually a very useful feature since we will be able to adjust the heating temperature for a particular tip regardless of the material and thickness. Subsequently, this resistor will be replaced by a normal variable for easy adjustment. The power of a converter will depend on the field effect transistors and overall power of the transformer. It's easy obtaining 100 to 150 watts with traditional FET similar to IRFZ44. You can use any N-channel transistors with a voltage of 30 volts. The current is preferably more than 40 amperes. By the way, FETs are installed on a common heat sink. Don't forget to use insulating gaskets. Let's return to the controller board. The PWM chip has a rather powerful output, unlike the traditional TL494. So there is no sense in supplementing the output with a driver or signals repeater in this circuit. The controller also provides a smooth start of the circuit, for which the capacitor is responsible. Resistor R5 sets the resting time for the transistors or the so-called dead time. Its value can be from 33 to 100 ohms. The capacitor C3 with the resistor R4 forms a frequency setting circuit. With these components, the operating frequency is around 47 kHz. It is desirable to take a power pulse transformer with an overall power of 200 watts. There is no sense to use more powerful. Suitable cores you can find from transformers of computer power supplies. The calculation of the transformer is done by a specialized program. The converter is push-pull type. With a standard core from the transformer of the computer power supply, the primary winding will contain 8 turns with a midpoint. The primary winding wire has a diameter of about 4 mm, that is, you can take, for example, 0.5 mm wire and assemble a bus of 8 and obtain the indicated 4 mm. Both shoulders are wound with the same wire and contain the same number of turns. The beginning of one bus connects to the end of the other. This forms the midpoint. To this midpoint is fed plus from the power source. On some episodes, the throttle is noticeable. It was later removed because of the uselessness. The secondary winding consists of one incomplete winding. Copper tape or standard wire can be used for winding. It is important to have an effective diameter of about 6 mm or more. The tip can be made of copper wire with a diameter of 1.5 to 2 mm. If the wire is in varnish insulation, it must be removed previously and then the wire is bent as follows. In my version, a tip was used from an old industrial soldering iron. It's made from iron 
And due to the fact that the electrical resistance of iron is much greater than the resistance of copper, the iron tip heats up more, although the heat conductivity of such a tip is less. By the way, working surface of the tip is advised to sharpen. Reducing the diameter of this area, we increase the heat, that is, the working part will be heated much more than the other parts of the tip. Such a soldering iron is capable of much. The power of the inverter will instantly heat the tip to the working temperature and solder massive heat consuming areas. The design has a huge reserve power, so with the help of such a soldering iron you can carry out any work. During the tests, I noticed that the optimal heating is achieved at a duty ratio of 25%. With a larger value, the tip is still heated. During operation with a duty cycle ratio of 25%, the current consumption from the power supply is about 1.5 amperes. This is good result because the batteries will not be overloaded during operation. And at the end I will answer the question which may arise somebody not related to electronics. Why not just take the battery, screw the tip to it and solder? I will upset them. It will not work. Firstly, in this case the batteries will work in the short circuit mode and in a matter of seconds will die. Secondly, the tip simply becomes red hot or melt at all as the temperature of such a system cannot be controlled. What kind of batteries to use and how to charge them, we will look at the next video. I will remind you that you will find all the necessary information in the description. I'm waiting for your evaluation, comments and wishes. Have a nice day. With you was Kaysian TV.